to talk about what it means or how to read the scriptures. Read, I'm using as an acronym, R-E-A-D. R stands for research, E stands for examine, A stands for analyze, and D stands for declare. Let's take a look at those right now. Research. There was a television program that used to come on, and it was called Dragnet. And one of the detectives on that show, he was a Los Angeles detective, he would always say when he was trying to get some information, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And the idea was, I just want to know what it says. And when we're reading the Bible, literally reading it out, we should just read it just to get an understanding, to get an idea of the bigger picture that's being presented. Reading the scripture begins with research. This begins with investigation. Investigation means I'm gathering information. Let's say a, a crime or some other event took place. When police and law enforcement people get there, they begin to gather the evidence to see what's going on. They can't come to a conclusion. They can't jump to a conclusion. They must first gather the evidence to see what the evidence is actually speaking to them and telling them. When we read scripture, we're gathering evidence from the scriptural narratives, accounts, and teachings in their complete context. This is exactly what Luke did before he wrote his books of Luke and Acts. He tells us that in Luke 1, verses 1 through 3, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants, of the word. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order. Most excellent Theophilus. And so he's just saying, I've gathered some information and I've put it into a chronological order so that we can take a look at the life and ministry of this person named Jesus, who you, Theophilus, the recipient of the letter, so you will understand who it is you've decided to follow after. The second letter in read, the E, is examine. The next step is to inspect the information we've gathered together and take a closer look. This is what the believers in Berea did in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. It tells us about them. These were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Paul, an apostle, had come through their area and he was sharing many things with them about the kingdom of God and about the name or truth and teaching about Jesus, the Son of God. But they had not heard anyone talk about these kinds of things, not in the way that Paul was doing. And so they would actually go back to the scriptures. Here's a thing that a lot of people aren't aware of. During this time, the books between Matthew to Revelation had not been written. So when the Bereans were seek, searching out scripture and when Paul was preaching the scripture, they were doing it with what we know as the Old Testament books. That is the books from Genesis to Malachi. So the truths and things that we need to understand and know about the Christ are actually in what we know as the Old Testament. But many of us are very unfamiliar with that except for some of the creation story about Noah and the ark, maybe the Tower of Babel, man named Abraham, another guy named Jacob who wrestled an angel. Uh, there's another guy named Joseph. We know about Moses and we know about Joshua and David. We know bits and pieces. But what we need to do is to be able to pull this all together to understand just how they work and how they complement one another. The third letter is A, analyze. The third step is to isolate a section of scripture and then analyze it. Take a deeper look at it, put it under the microscope. We need to review, 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 which is another way of saying meditate on the information we are examining or analyzing. It's kind of interesting. When we think about meditation, I'm not talking about where people um, fold their legs and then put their hands in a particular type of form and then think about nothing. The Bible never really tells us to study the scripture. It tells us to meditate on the scripture. 
Now, for those of you who are going to go right to 2 Timothy 2.15, where it says, study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, I'm very familiar with the passage. But if you look at uh, what the word actually means, it doesn't mean to study as we do in an academic sense. It means to be diligent. Make every effort to show yourself the type of person who's going to pursue understanding and knowing the word of God. Remember, we read the passage from Ezra 7.10. He prepared his heart to pursue the word of the Lord, to practice it and to present it to others. So we want to analyze, we want to think it through. I've always found it interesting when you think of meditation from a biblical perspective, the Bible tells us, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it therein day and night. And there when you shall make your way prosperous and you shall have good success. There's another passage that says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. The idea of meditation, remember, the Hebrew people were nomadic shepherds, so they looked at things from a concrete perspective. When God divided animals for eating into two groups, clean and unclean, one of the characteristics of a clean animal was that it was a ruminant. That's R-U-M-I-N-A-N-T. And what that means is they would eat food and it would go into a first space or stomach, sit there for a while, and then it would come back up with some new flavor, and they would chew on it some more, and then it would go into a second stomach. Sometime later, it would come back up with still new flavor, and they would chew on it some more, and then it would finally go into its fourth stomach, and then continue on its way. <laughs> That's my best way of putting it. Cows do it, sheep do it, goats do it, a few other animals, giraffes even do it. That's right. Giraffes are considered clean animals if you're so interested in a giraffe steak. Most folks have never had those. Don't know if I'd recommend one, but there you have it. They make the grade. But the idea is that you continue to go over it, go over it, go over the text of Scripture until you really begin to kind of see yourself uh, either in the situation or event or being so closely connected to it, you begin to really sense what may have been going on in the lives of the people who were involved in it. Six things you want to ask while you're doing this process of analyzing are one, and we'll show you the questions along the bottom as well. What is the event or the occasion? In other words, what's going on? What's happened? It's sort of like you've heard a, a, there's an auto accident. First question people ask, what happened? Even if they see there was an accident, it's still what happened, what's going on? Second, who is involved? What person, group, or entire nation is involved in the event that you are looking at? Third, when is the event or occasion taking place? Is it taking place on a regular holiday? Is it happening during the spring, the summer, the fall, the winter? Is it happening... Uh, for, for somebody's birthday or some other, again, event or occasion. Is it a wedding? Is it a funeral? I mean, what is the purpose? What is happening? Why is this thing going on? Why was it recorded? Four, where is the event or occasion taking place? Is it taking place in someone's house, outside the house, in a city, town, or village? Is it happening somewhere um, hundreds of miles away from where the person came from? But where is the event taking place? Number five, why is the event or occasion taking place? What is its purpose? Six, how did things turn out? When you're reading all of the passage about a given thing, and that's why it's important to read more than just a verse or two, you want to read a whole chapter, better a whole book, to get the big picture and, and establish a frame of reference. So as you're analyzing it, you then begin to pull out a piece of the puzzle, so to speak, but you'll see where that piece fits in and why it's where it is. So many people put things together in Scripture that just don't belong. They just don't belong. But many folks are unaware of that. You don't want to be that person. You want to have a clear, accurate, and relevant understanding of Scripture so that when you talk about it, you, as well as the person you're speaking to, gets edified by that. The fourth thing in reading Scripture is to declare. 
This final step is to declare by sharing what you have researched, examined, and analyzed. Declaring can be done verbally by what you speak or visually showing it by the way you work it out or live it out. Remember, Ezra set his heart to study or to pursue the law of the Lord and to practice it, teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. I'm going to show other people what the word of God is saying. Secondly, the psalmist writes, the unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. To be simple just means to not have an understanding of what God expects you to do. Doesn't mean you are ignorant in the sense of lack of sense or that kind of thing. It just means you don't know. And actually, ignorant just means to not know. It doesn't mean it shouldn't be used as a derogatory term, although it is, but it really just means you don't know. And so we don't want you to be the person that doesn't know. We want you to begin that process of knowing the Word of God.